kid who used to come to Lake Norman on weekends in the summertime, just about every weekend. After my dad would get off work, he was postmaster in Krauss, about 30 minutes from here, and uh, I would put my bathing suit on under my clothes and be ready. My mom would have a TV dinner, and I mean a real TV dinner, like all those metal trays, some of you might remember those. She'd have that ready for him. He would eat on the way there. I'd have my bathing suit on under my clothes. My sister and I would hop in the back seat, and before the tires quit moving, I had jumped in the lake, and I stayed there all weekend. Uh, usually I went home with a wet bathing suit because they had to call me out of the lake on Sunday evenings to go back home to Krause. And I'd go home and, and wash some of the mud out of my bathing suit. And I loved coming to the lake, and I loved swimming in the water. And I don't understand it when my kids say, there's nothing to do around here. I just think that's not true. There's a lake, and there's, there's board games to play. There's all kinds of things to do. But anyway, that's another sermon. I loved the lake. I loved swimming. But sometimes that playground that I was so fond of could be just a little bit dangerous. And we used to have, you know, cousins and friends would all show up and we would all be having a good time. And I remember one time, one of my cousins who was maybe a year younger than me, than me uh, we were kind of horsing around and I jumped off the pier and he thought he'd play a great trick on me. And he jumped in a little too quick, jumped right on top of me. Let me tell you, this is not a good idea. It was really scary. It was very scary because I felt his feet on my back pushing me down to the bottom of the lake. And I was panicked because I needed to breathe. And it was a very urgent need to breathe. And I was near the bottom. I, I tried to find it and push off and swim up to the top as quickly as I could. And when I broke the surface, I gasped for air. I was confused. And then I was angry. And I don't know if I ratted my cousin out, but I tell you what, if I ratted him out, I bet he felt something too that day on his backside. But let me tell you, that precious breath of air, I wanted it, I needed it, I had to have it. I want us to do a little breathing exercise today, so bear with me, okay? We're going to breathe in, and then we're going to exhale as long as we can and hold that exhale and wait to breathe in until you have to breathe in. Now, if you've got breathing problems or it's going to make you cough, don't do it. Just watch the rest of us turn to okay? But everybody that can, try this one. We're going to breathe in and we're going to exhale and hold it as long as we can. Different. Now we'd get in the car, but 
it was to go visit family or to be at the lake visiting with friends. But there was a rhythm, there was some downtime that we enjoyed. Now in the Gospel of Luke, when we read that the baby Jesus is, is brought to the temple by Mary and Joseph, we see what, well, if we saw him out here today outside the church doors, we might take him for kind of a crazy old man. Simeon takes that baby and holds him up and consecrates him to God. And he, he's been waiting his whole life for this moment. You have to understand that he's been patiently counting on the promises of God, that he would see the Messiah before it was time for him to die. And so, with gratitude, he praises God and he blesses this child. But he also says this in verse 34 and 35. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that they will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, notice the words are not rising and falling. <coughs> They're falling and rising. Breathe out, breathe in. Jesus will be spoken against, persecuted, arrested, crucified. This falling will clear away the clutter so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Exhale, all breath is out. And breathe in. In rhythmic living, allowing time to breathe, these natural rhythms, well, it kind of gives us time to focus on what is most important. And I'll bet that some, if not all of you, gathered with family or friends or took some quiet time yourself over this Christmas holiday, maybe had some time off from work and sat around the table, sat around the living room, spent some time, some downtime. A friend of mine referred me to a book a couple months ago, which, which I kind of like. It's uh, The Four Things That Matter Most. It's written by... Ira Brock, who was a medical doctor, and he says that there are four phrases that will have a profound impact for improving our relationships and our lives. And these are those four phrases. They're short. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. And I love you. So it's please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. I love you. You may want to remember these words and, and use them when you need to, to heal a relationship, to say goodbye to someone, or find some closure when a, when a relationship is ended. These words, they, they open us up to be vulnerable, and they expand our capacities for forgiveness, for gratitude, and for love. You see, there's a rhythm in these words that I like as well. There's a pause, and there's transformative power. Breathe them in. Please forgive me. Breathe out. I forgive you. Breathe in. Thank you. Breathe out. I love you. When we find phrases like this or faith traditions that sometimes do things better than our own, I think it's... It's time for us to take note of, of what other people do to, to hear what God might be saying, to help us quiet our voices, to take some Sabbath time to be grateful and spend time around a table, light candles, and rest. The rhythm of Jesus' life as an infant followed the faith tradition of the family into which he was born. They breathe out. The firstborn male is consecrated in the temple. This was an emptying out of sorts, offering this son to God, dedicating this child to praise God. And in the scripture, you will notice that the last part of Simeon's words, and this is directed at Mary, is, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. 
we're reminded here of the anguish that Mary will experience as her son rose into his calling and he's taken down, hung on a cross to die between common criminals, the falling before the rising, which is the crucifixion and the resurrection. Parents know no worse anguish than seeing the suffering of their own children. It's a piercing sword to their souls. And Mary is a very human mother. She's the mother of God, but she's very human, and she will not be exempt from this pain either. Breathing out crucifixion, breathing in resurrection. And so, as Christ followers, we may have our souls pierced as well. We may experience the fall before the rise. Because you see, something in us has to die, has to perish before we can rise again. It might, might be our own selfish motives or, or needs or wants or wills. We must put those to death before we can be filled with holy bread. We must be emptied so that we can be filled. Now this emptying, it's, it's sometimes very, very difficult. And it is so piercing. But if you remember these four phrases, I think they will help us. Forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. And I love you. I think these words can help us empty ourselves. I'm aware, keenly aware this year that Christmas can be a difficult season. Um, some of you may know my mother passed away just a few months ago. And like other people, I'm experiencing the first holiday season with someone here who I love who's no longer here. Sometimes people have a hard time after a marriage dissolves going through a holiday season, a Christmas season. Sometimes we're faced with what we think might be maybe the last Christmas with an aging parent. Or it might be the bittersweet end of childhood when some of the magic and sparkle of Christmas morning has gone off to college and come back seeing things differently. Let me tell you, I know about that too. These rhythms of life, this falling and rising, Breathing in and breathing out, sorrow and comfort, sorrow and comfort. You see, the promise of the Christian life is, is not of no suffering. It's not the promise of an easy life. It's the promise that through it all, that God will be with us. We breathe out, let it go, breathe in, let God have whatever it is. For Simeon and Anna, seeing the baby Jesus, the Messiah, with their own eyes, after a lifetime, a lifetime of faithful waiting, well, this is the fulfillment of a promise. And with prophetic voices joining those of Mary and Zechariah earlier in the book of Luke, they point to this this necessary rhythm of life, the falling and rising, planting a seed in the ground so that it may be born again as a new plant, repenting of our sin and allowing God to cleanse our hearts so that we can become more Christ-like, we can rise up in our daily living. Simeon and Anna have breathed out in their waiting and seeing the Messiah, they breathe in. You know, we live in a time where waiting, waiting is really hard for us to do now. Siri, find me an Indian restaurant. Okay, Google, what's the best recipe for apple pie? You know, we can get on an airplane and go to sleep for a few hours and wake up thousands of miles away from home. We can text our kids during a business meeting. We can post pictures of Christmas dinner to the in-laws in Wisconsin. We can play words with friends with someone who's living in Iceland. We have a hard time with waiting. Everything's instant. And 
our natural rhythms, I think, have really been disturbed. It's hard to make that quiet space to hear the voice of God. We have a hard time waiting on God. Our lifestyles have programmed waiting out of our days. But you see, as Christians, we are really called to be a striking difference in the world. The world really should see the rhythms of our life. The breathing out, emptying ourselves, and the breathing in, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they should see that and see what a difference it makes. One of my favorite Christian writers is N.T. Wright. He's an Anglican priest and a theologian. And he says that Christian living means dying with Christ and rising again. That is part of the meaning of baptism, the starting point of the Christian pilgrimage. Go back and, and look at the service of baptism in your hymn books or look it up online. It is a putting to death. It is a falling and a rising. We rise up and begin our Christian life. So remember, remember your baptisms, whether they were yesterday or 80 years ago. And in these quiet days, after the busyness of Christmas is all over, I just want to invite you to find time to breathe, time to wait, time to forgive and be forgiven, time to be grateful, and time to tell someone that you love them. I have no doubt that we'll find ourselves in situations where the wind's knocked out of us. Maybe someone will jump on you and knock, knock you to the bottom of the lake or the pool, or maybe the next time you're stuck in traffic on the way to Morrisville or Charlotte, or you're standing in line waiting to return a gift, or maybe when you're struggling to say, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, I love you. Remember this natural rhythm of the Christian life, the falling, the rising. Remember, we are called to die with Christ and to therefore rise to a new life. We empty ourselves, we offer ourselves to be consecrated. We offer a sacrifice like Mary and Joseph. And we are filled with that which we have waited for for our whole lives. Let the holy enter your life with every exhale and inhale. Just breathe. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.